Right. And let me fix this. Excuse me. You got yours on, Jim? I, I, I use it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's do this. Hold on. Just hold on. <laughs> okay. That's too bad. Yeah, we'll go down there. No, you're not. Ten. We're gonna go, Jim, in five, four, three, two. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Facebook Live event uh, presented by Siteman Cancer Center, based at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Today's topic is colorectal cancer, the importance of screening, and recent advances in clinical care. And joining us today is Dr. Matthew Much, who leads the colorectal uh, cancer surgery team at WashU and at Siteman. And Dr. Much also is the Gershwin Professor of Surgery at the School of Medicine. Dr. Much, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, we'll start with a, a first question, but first, uh, I guess I wanted to let viewers know that during this live event, we encourage you to submit questions in the comments section uh, for Dr. Much to answer later on. Uh, now, Dr. Much, to start, can you tell us uh, how common colon cancer is and what should men and women know about it? Well, your lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer, uh, if you live in the United States, is about 6%. So just about just over one out of 20 people will eventually de develop colorectal cancer. Uh, the three things that I, that I would like sort of our viewers to take home from tonight is that colorectal cancer screening is incredibly important. Colorectal cancer is incredibly uh, preventable. And if you're unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with colorectal cancer, it is a very treatable and curable disease. The point is if, if viewers don't take anything else away from this, they need to know the importance of screening, that colon cancer is preventable, and that the way to prevent it is to be screened regularly. Exactly. Very good. Now, as you know, as a, as a surgeon, a lot of people find excuses not to be screened. Uh, they say that, the, uh, that a colonoscopy makes them feel uncomfortable or, or that they don't have a family history of, of the disease, so why bother? What do you say to people who, who are thinking that? Well, the, the major hurdle is the sort of the day before, is the prep. You know, it, it, that, that's an inherent sort of negative about the test, and there's really no way around that. You need to clean the colon of everything so that when you do the exam that you're able to see the mucosa or the lining of the colon in its entirety. So you want it as clean as possible. There have been some very good advances in the preps that have occurred, uh, tend to be smaller volume. They do what we now call as a split prep where you do half of it before you go to bed and then you wake up in the morning and do the other half so it's smaller bits so it tends to be a little bit more tolerable. But if you look at studies, it's generally is what the prep is the, is the major hurdle. The exam itself is actually very easy. You, you generally, you, you know, you'll get a, some level of anesthesia, whether it's sort of twilight anesthesia or whether it's more of a, a deep general anesthetic where you're completely out. Uh, but w the exam itself is actually very well tolerated. And certainly it's no more uncomfortable than having the disease itself. Absolutely. Okay. Well worth the discomfort. Very good. Now, I w again, I want to remind viewers that if you have any questions based on what uh, Dr. Much is saying, please enter those in the comment section, and we'll have him answer those later on. Now, to talk a little uh, the recommendations were typically to start at age 50. There has been an increase in the incidence of colorectal cancer in people below the age of 50. So that, that guideline is now moving down to around 45 or so. Those are for people that are asymptomatic and symptoms would include bleeding, change in bowel habits, abdominal pain, weight loss. So if you're experiencing none of those things. Then you would be an average risk patient and, you, and if there's no family history. Okay. Uh, if that would put you as an average risk patient and you should start screening around 45. If you have a family history, uh, typically a first degree relative. And that is a mother, a brother, a, a mom, sister. dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles are second degree, grandparents would be second degree. Uh, if you have a first degree relative, 
you should start 10 years before they were diagnosed with either a polyp or a cancer. So if they were diagnosed under the age of 55, then you should start screening before 55. Okay. And what if someone's unsure about a family history? Is this something we should be asking our relatives or if someone's adopted? Is it, what, what might you suggest for them? So, yes, I would ask your, you know, the members of your family, have they had their colonoscopies or have they had colorectal cancer screening? Have, and what did they find? Did they have polyps? Did they have a cancer so that you, be, you are aware and you can then implant or influence or impact your own screening? Okay. Now, if you're adopted, those, that's a challenging situation just because you don't know. So, the, typically would fall into the general guidelines of starting at age 50. 45. Okay, very good. Now, colonoscopies, of course, are the traditional screening method, and as you mentioned earlier, they're still considered the gold standard, the best uh, method for uh, detecting colon cancer. Um, what, what are you looking at during a colonoscopy? What are you looking for? So the, the colonoscopy is both sort of what we call diagnostic, meaning it can find polyps or cancers or other things, you know, if you have inflammation or other things going on, but it can then be therapeutic. So if you see a polyp, you're able to then remove it at the time. So what you're looking for is normally the, the sort of the mucosa or the lining of the colon is flat, and you're looking for small areas that are, are raised or elevated. Early polyps that are seen are generally in the three millimeter size, and so they're actually quite small. About how big is that? Uh, well, 250 millimeters is an inch. Okay. So a tenth of an inch, Very good. and uh, you know the the camera itself magnifies your view about two and a half times, so it looks much bigger than it really is. The point is that the problem can be taken care of at that moment before the patient even leaves um, the the hospital. Um, is this? And I want to remind people: these polyps are not cancerous. Is that correct? Correct. These, these are sort of adenomatous polyps are precancerous polyps, and the thing what makes it so preventable is the two factors is number one there's a very long what we call dwell period or time that it takes for a polyp to develop and then grow and turn into a cancer and that can be anywhere from a seven to ten year process so you have a, a long time to intervene uh, the other is that if you remove the polyp you've then prevented a cancer okay very good now again colonoscopies are still considered the best test but um, there are a number of other tests that are now available any one of them would be better than not being screened at all. Is that correct? correct? I, I mean, the, the amount of data that's out there that shows that any form of colorectal cancer screening is beneficial in, in both preventing cancers and increasing your chances of living longer. Very good. And I understand we have a screen here that lists the different types of tests. Would you mind describing what some of the other ones are? Besides so the colonoscopy. the colonoscopy goes all the way from the rectum to the what we call the cecum or the very beginning of the colon. Uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy really only sees the left side of the colon and probably anywhere from a third to maybe a half of it. Uh, virtual colonoscopy is essentially a CAT scan colonoscopy. You still need to do a full prep. They then will fill your colon full of air and you will get a CAT scan. Typically those are reserved for patients who have an incomplete colonoscopy or for some reason are on blood thinners or have some medical condition that they cannot uh, undergo a, a full colonoscopy and then will, uh, a CT colonography is then a good adjunct uh, for screening. Then there are a couple stool-based tests. Uh, one is uh, looking for uh, DNA or cancer cells or cancer genes in your, in your stool. Uh, those are becoming increasingly effective and then you can also look for blood in your stool. And there are a couple of fecal occult blood testing, and then there's a sort of the fecal immune chemical test, which is a little bit more uh, sensitive. Uh, but you need to remember that if any of the sort of bottom three are positive, you still need a colonoscopy. Okay, but and this is certainly uh, something that someone's physician can discuss with a patient, decide what the best option is for him or her, and move forward from there? Correct. Okay, very good. Um, I, I guess we do have some few, uh, view, a few viewer questions here already. Um, and David asks, what is the latest research and clinical trial results for stage four colon cancer? So uh, probably in the last 
seven to 10 years, we've made significant advancements in the uh, response of colorectal cancer to chemo, our sort of new chemotherapy agents. And, you know, a decade ago, average survival of stage four colon cancer was anywhere from 16 to 20 months. And now it's routinely up to three years or even longer. Uh, and the, sort of in many respects, the, the concept has sort of changed from a uh, treatment to sort of eradicate, but to keep at bay and allow sort of patients to live a, a good quality of life along with the with the cancer. Okay, it might be helpful to explain that you know while you're the, you're the surgeon on the care team, it is a larger extended team. Sometimes it might include a medical oncologist. Uh, perhaps a, a radiation oncologist. I'm, I'm unsure of that, but but the point is that there are a number of doctors with s specific specialties that come together to determine the right treatment plan for it, for each patient, um, and then do his or her part um, to see that patient through the end of treatment. Correct. The, you know, colorectal cancer is a sort of a multimodal treatment or a multidisciplinary treatment uh, disease, particularly rectal cancer. So the difference between colon cancer and rectal cancer is there the same sort of type of cell? It's the lining of the, of the colon and the rectum, but it's the location. The rectum is the last six inches of the colon, and where it sits anatomically, it, you, we tend to treat that a little bit differently, so that's the major distinction. So for rectal cancer, it often involves a, a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, and then, a, and then us as surgeons. Uh, and for colon cancer, uh, typically in a very broad general sense, if the lymph nodes are not involved, once you've removed the, the, the tumor, you typically don't need chemotherapy. If the lymph nodes are involved, then that is generally an indication for... If the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes, correct. then you might need chemotherapy. There are other you know, sort of nuances in there, but in general sense, it's really based on the lymph nodes or that pathology result once the specimen is removed. The point is everybody gets a treatment plan that makes the most sense for him or her, and, and it's a number of physicians who come together and help that patient determine what the right plan is. Correct. Okay. Uh, David had a follow-up question, and he was wondering about uh, proton therapy. That would be, you know, administered, of course, by radiation uh, a therapist. Um, is it, it's hard to find information on this, he's, and he's wondering if it uh, works on colon cancer tumors. Uh, not so much. Colon cancer is not treated with radiation. There are very rare exceptions. Uh, but rectal cancer, which routinely is, is typically not, you know, we do not use photon therapy for rectal cancer. It's usually sort of more of what we call just traditional external beam radiation therapy. Okay, very good. Now we have a question here from Jen who's wondering about the prevention side of, of the disease. And she's wondering what kinds of foods should people avoid to, to lower the risk of colorectal cancer? Very good, important question, hard question to ultimately sort of answer. Uh, if you look at things that are, have been shown to prevent colorectal cancer, uh, aspirin, calcium, uh, there's some data on psyllium or uh, yeah, psyllium supplements. Uh, things that increase your risk, and this is more based on uh, population-based studies, is that countries that ingest a high number of animal fat, meats with animal, or from, um, animal high fat, high, high fat uh, meats, have an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, patients who grew up in countries where they had ate a lot of plant-based foods, uh, Japan, Africa, who then migrate to developed countries where they adopt that sort of westernized diet, their risk of colorectal cancer increases to those of the people of that native country. And so that's probably, to me, the strongest evidence that we have of the impact of our diet on our risk of colorectal cancer. Limit the number of foods you eat that, that are high. I think it's a high processed preservatives and things that we, you know, are, is now um, sort of so commonplace in our diets and our foods. Okay. And I'll point out to our viewers that if you go to Siteman's website, um, there's a number of, uh, of articles about preventing cancer under the prevention tab. And that website is siteman.wustl.edu. Um, 
Dr. Much, it was a few years ago, it was announced that parts of Missouri and Southern Illinois are in one of three U.S. hotspots uh, for colorectal cancer, where it's a particular problem. Um, and we were going to show, go ahead and show that map there, um, noting that. Um, it's along the, the southern part of the Mississippi River, including those parts of Missouri and Illinois, and then also West Central Appalachia and the, and the Virginia-North Carolina border. Um, now, deaths in these particular areas due to colorectal cancer are, are much higher than elsewhere. Uh, what seems to be going on in these areas more so than, than in others? Uh, short answer is I wish we honestly knew. I think that, you know, it's definitely a combination of sort of genetics and environment, uh, meaning that, you know, our diets uh, and sort of what our sort of daily behaviors are, and I think we'll talk later or, or later about sort of sedentary and, and obesity and the impacts of all of those factors on colorectal cancer. I'm sure those all play into it. Uh, we definitely have a number of efforts going on here at Siteman to increase screening availability and efforts in those areas because it is important. Very good. And as you mentioned, um, there's another researcher here, Dr. Yin Kao, who uh, recently discovered that uh, there are, seem to be links to a higher risk of colorectal cancer in young people, um, younger people. She found that obesity uh, is associated with an increased risk for um, women who are younger than 50. And then also, as you mentioned, a sedentary lifestyle, which of course is sitting around too much, is linked to an increased risk for uh, men and women who are younger than 50. Um, are you seeing more younger uh, patients with colorectal cancer? Definitely. Uh, I would say that it, it, you know, it's, when I started practice, you know, 16, 17 years ago, it was more of a disease of 60s and 70s, and now it's clearly shifted to the 60s and 50s, and even younger. Uh, I think some, you know, some of the factors that you listed there as far as obesity and, um, sedentary, and, and sedentary activity is, colorectal cancer, there seems to be a underlying sort of inflammatory process associated with it. If you look at other sort of diseases such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease that are inflammatory based uh, diseases, they have a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer. And as we're learning more about our diet and high fats and processed foods is that those tend to be inflammatory as well. Okay. And you know, sort of even the sedentary lifestyle, believe it or not, tends to be a sort of a pro-inflammatory okay, state. Well, uh, unfortunately, again, if, if you're interested in learning more about prevention, I would invite you to visit uh, Simon's uh, website. And, and again, this is all the more reason for folks to get to schedule a screening around their 50th birthday or even sooner in the case of folks who have a family history or other, other conditions that may uh, increase risk. Um, now, of course, you're involved in, in research, too, including developing better uh, therapies for colorectal cancer. Uh, could you describe some recent advances that are now available to patients? Well, I think that uh, as far as colon cancer, surgery is, always, is, is the mainstay of treatment. And some of the bigger advances that have occurred over the last sort of decade has been the introduction of minimally invasive techniques, uh, whether that's laparoscopic or robotic. Uh, techniques to remove the colon. I think as an adjunct then what that has allowed us to do is sort of change how we take care of patients after surgery and sort of the what has grown to be known as the sort of enhanced recovery after surgery. And so we early feeding, uh, we have them, you know, even eat or drink up until the time of surgery, uh, multimodal pain therapy so that we can minimize narcotic use early ambulation to get you up and moving, prevent the uh, developing blood clots in your legs and things of that nature. And that has allowed us to really decrease the length of stay after surgery by almost two days. Wow. So people can get up, get back to their normal life mm -hmm. uh, sooner and with less pain? Correct. Very good. Now, I, I guess I want to emphasize again, for those who haven't been screened, what are symptoms that they should be aware of? Well, I think the, the most important aspect out of all of this is that 75% of patients who develop colorectal cancer don't have an identifiable uh, family history and don't have symptoms. So that, um, you know, so that's where the importance of screening 
at an age appropriate time. Now, if you do develop symptoms and those are, that is bleeding uh, in your, associated with bowel movements, uh, abdominal pain, unexplained weight loss, uh, a change in your bowel habits that's sort of more consistent than, you know, if you go on vacation and you overeat and you're constipated, that's, you know, things that are explainable. But if you have a consistent change in your bowel habits, then those are all reasons that you should get screening or, you know, get examined, evaluated sooner. But it's certainly better to get screened before any of those things might occur. Correct. Um, I see we do have a few more uh, viewer questions here. Uh, one from Autumn who asks, if both parents have had colon cancer, uh, is age still, what is, is 46 still the recommended age for, uh, for screening? Well, so if you have a first degree relative that has developed colorectal cancer, you have about a two to three fold increase risk. Now, if you have two first degree relatives, then that uh, risk goes up. Generally, those tend to be on one side of the family. If they are on both sides of the family, uh, then you know I would I would consider evaluation for some sort of gene underlying genetic syndrome. But as far as timing of screening, I would say 10 years before your mom or dad, whoever was younger, was diagnosed with their colon cancer. Is the cancer. right time for you. Correct. Okay, very good. Now Arnell asks, if you have had a colonoscopy and they found a polyp, are you supposed to have another test in five years instead of 10? Correct. Okay. So it, things that will impact your sort of what we call your screening interval or how frequently you are screened will be the findings of sort of that initial colonoscopy. So if you have a single polyp, and it's removed and it's small, then five years is, is appropriate. If you have sort of more of a, what we would call an advanced lesion, and that's about a half, a cent, half an inch in size um, or multiple polyps, that could shorten that screening interval down to three years. Okay. Have, have a conversation with your doctor. If you have any concerns, certainly um, that's where a good place to start. Correct. Okay. Uh, Martha is asking, what kind of recovery time is there after surgery? Uh, well, generally, the, the hospital stay at, um, after surgery is about three to maybe five days, somewhere in there. It's a matter of getting your bowels working, getting you eating, getting you up and around, making sure that your pain's under control and everything is healing well. And then when you get home, part of the first general four to six weeks of surgery are definitely the steepest part of the climb. The foods don't taste normal. You get full quickly. It doesn't take much to wipe you out. You feel fine, you go in, get cleaned up, come out, then you lay down and need to sort of take a nap. For people to get back to how they're feeling, you know, at, before surgery generally is about three to four months. They feel fine, it's just a matter of energy, stamina. If you're not taking narcotics and your pain is under control, generally people can start driving about two weeks or so after surgery. Uh, depending upon the sort of the rigors of your job, Anywhere from four to eight weeks after surgery, you can return to work. Okay, good information. Um, we have a question here from David who's asking, what are your thoughts on probiotics? Do they help in any way? Uh, once again, sort of a hard answer to, to give you a definitive yes or no. I think that um, they clearly don't hurt and sort of what the true benefit of them is, is been hard to sort of tarse out. Okay. Uh, but I think that if you take them and you notice that things are, that your bowel habits are more regular or you feel better, then by all means, I would support taking them. Very good. Uh, Dr. Much, uh, we've run out of time. And again, we appreciate you being here and for, sh and for sharing this important information with our viewers. Um, and to our viewers, we thank you for joining us as well uh, for this discussion on colon cancer, uh, prevention, and uh, clinical advances in care. Uh, please follow Simon's Facebook page uh, to learn about future Facebook Live events. Uh, and thank you again for joining us today.